This is Juan from Photo Innovation Lab based out of Chicago. Um, he'll be talking about fine art papers and cotton-based papers, and then also the printing workflow. Um, if you also go to our offers, which is below the chat, um, you can see he's doing 15% off. So you can upload your images at his website, use the 15% off code to get some of your images printed at Photo Innovation Lab, which is great. Um, on the right side, there's going to be a chat where you can post some of your questions. So Juan's going to go through his presentation and every now and then we're going to stop, answer some questions. And um, if we don't get to your question, feel free to email us at the end. We can always answer them afterwards, but we're going to try to go through as many as we can. And we'll also go through some at the end. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Juan. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Paige. Um, my name is again Juan Hernandez, and I'm the founder of Photo Innovation Lab. And I've been printing for about 10 years now. Uh, I've been really in and out of photography for the past 20. Uh, so uh, I, when I started uh, doing photography, I was uh, about 20 years old and digital printing wasn't the thing yet, uh, of course. Um, and I really grew into printing through the, my experience in, in, in the lab and enlarging my images there. I really wanted to come back into photography so I decided that uh, printing was something that I really, was really good at. So um, I started Photo Innovation Lab about eight, eight years ago. And uh, well, the idea there is um, really because I, kind of like I felt that there was a huge gap between uh, kind of like left because of all the digital um, explosion in image sharing that we kind of lost touch with the uh, physical object. And, and you know, the other reason for that is archivability, right? So uh, the ability to preserve our images is better on, on, on paper than on any uh, digital file. So um, with that said, I'm gonna jump over to um, the slide here. Give me one second. And, and as uh, you're doing that, yeah. um, if your uh, screen freezes or something happens, you could just refresh your browser and uh, it should just come right back up. Awesome. So today we're going to be focusing on fine art papers and uh, then we're going to be talking uh, a bit about the printing work workflow uh, that we use here at Photo, Photo Innovation Lab. Um, so uh, the goal, again, uh, learning why uh, printing on fine art papers, specifically tree free papers is best for the environment and for your uh, image preservation. And then uh, we're gonna go through and look at uh, some insights uh, and uh, the workflow that, that we use and some technology that's, that's gonna be key to uh, making the best prints possible. So um, I, I did talk a little bit about uh, Photo Innovation Lab myself, but I really wanted to highlight something that I feel that is core to um, to to the business, uh, to my business, and that is uh, climate climate action and um, sustainability. And uh, basically, everything that we do is geared towards that. Uh, the papers that we use have been selected based on. Um, the company's ability to have um, kind of like a, a good record of environmental stewardship. Um, that's one thing. And then the other thing is packaging material. Uh, we may all, all basically all our, of our packaging is, is, is uh, compostable. Uh, so we try to leave the least impact to, to our environment as, um, as we run the business. Uh, cool thing, um, as of January of this year, we became part of the 1% for the planet uh, organization. And what that means is that we're pledging 1% of all our sales to uh, nonprofit organizations that, um, that are spending their time and energy in safeguarding our environment and pushing for climate action and change. Um, so, uh, into the meat of this. So why why do we print on uh, tree-free papers and why is that important? And I, I mean, I really couldn't 
possibly list all of the reasons why this is important, but these are, I feel that like the most important to me and to the business. Um, primarily it's, they're 100% biodegradable. Um, and this doesn't, uh, speak exclusively to cotton based papers. Um, there are going to be tree free papers that are 100% biodegradable, but, um, it really speaks to, uh, the fact that uh, when you're uh, making your fine art prints, um, you're making them on, on papers that are not resin coated. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, the resin that's added to the paper uh, to to hold it together, basically, is non-biodegradable. So um, every time we print on, on, on these sorts of papers, uh, we're creating more... Um, trash uh, for the environment. I know that sounds a little harsh, but uh, the truth of the matter is that um, these papers are really not uh, good in terms of how they're produced and uh, how they eventually get discarded. Uh, so that's one, one of the main reasons. The second reason is uh, the lower environmental impact. Um, and, 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 the thing is, uh, when producing cotton-based papers, there's a lot less energy involved in the production of the paper. And uh, not only that, it's there's the chemical process that's involved in, in making um, the pulp or the fiber white. Um, so there's a lot less chemicals that are being uh, discarded into the waterways uh, when we're making um, cotton-based papers. So uh, chemistry and energy are a huge part of, of, of that lowering the environmental impact of, of these papers. Uh, number three there, uh, they have a longer shelf life and we'll talk a little bit more about, um, uh, about that, but um, it's important to note here that uh, the papers that we uh, offer here at Photo Innovation Lab, uh, none of them carry optical brightening agents. And what optical brightening agents uh, do is they add, um, they basically make paper feel more white, reflect more white. They're, uh, uh, they enhance uh, the paper's ability to saturate color um, and uh, produce kind of like darker blacks, if you will. Um, and that's really why they're used. But the reality of, of them is that they are photosensitive. So over time, uh, they'll degrade. Uh, so if you're thinking about selling your prints or just storing them for, for future generations, know that when you're printing with papers that contain OBA content, um, that uh, they're gonna be affected by the fact that light will um, interact with with those optical brightening agents and deteriorate them over time. And then the last thing there is the, like there's a wide vari var variety of textures and, and, and finishes available to you. So there's not only uh, cotton is one of the, the main fibers that um, that, uh, that meet our, our environmental standards, but there's um, other fibers such as bark, hemp, bamboo um, that are that are beautiful to work with so there's a wider th there's a really wide gamut of, of papers available for you to experiment with um, in in the, in this range so the next couple of slides I'm gonna uh, do a little feature on on the papers that we use and showcase some of the differences so this is the a close-up of the Moab and Trada we talked a little bit about texture on the paper. I feel that uh, this paper really has a beautiful texture. Um, it's not overwhelming um, like other fine art papers. Uh, I feel that for photography, they're really uh, uh, coarse in terms of their texture, but this paper is really soft and, and the texture that, that, that it has really enhances um, every single one of the images that are produced with it. Um, it's a warmer tone paper. Um, most of um, the the fine art papers uh, made by Moab are a little on the warmer side, um, and hopefully we're going to be able to see that on the next slide. Uh, this is um, side by side of the Canson uh, Infinity Photographique, 
uh, paper that we also carry here at Photo Innovation Lab and uh, the Moab and Chata Rag Natural, uh, the paper that we just saw. And this is uh, more so to compare uh, one tone of the paper and then texture. Like I said, that there's gonna be a wide uh, variety of different textures available uh, through the fine art papers. And uh, in, in this case, the Canson is, is a paper that has a very, very smooth finish. Um, and compared to, to the Moab, it also uh, has a, a, it's, it's a wider uh, paper. So if you're thinking about uh, brightness uh, as being important to your project, uh, this is a paper that you, um, that, that you would possibly be wanting to, to, look, to look into. Um, uh, here, I compared the two glossy papers that, I, that, that we carry, and that's the, in, uh, the Canson Infinity Platine um, and the Moab Juniper Burrita. Again, uh, this is, it, it's not gonna be clear here. It's not uh, a great image to, to look at, to see um, kind of like the reflectivity and the, shim, the, the shine on the paper. But it was really meant to um, compare kind of like some of the, the, the texture. Uh, uh, the Juniper Burrito has um, a little bit more texture than the uh, Infinity Platine. It's also a warmer tone paper. And um, because I really wanted to highlight that um, on the next slide, uh, um, I highlight that uh, the next slide will show a, a, a better comparison between the two. So. Uh, when thinking about, and, and we'll talk about this on the next slide too, but the kind of like one of the things that I that I want to leave you guys with is that it's it's very um, paper selection should be part of your creative process. I think that that's something that you should be thinking about um, from the onset, and not something that you start uh, thinking about towards the end of the project. Um, in this particular case, just looking at uh, these two um, cuts of the images. Um, on the left-hand side, you've got the Juniper Brita. On the right-hand side, you've got the Kansas Inf In Infinity uh, Platine. And, and the, kind of like the important, the takeaway from this is the tonality of, of both papers. Both images are black and white. Um, and uh, because of the warmness of the Juniper Brita, um, you, you get to see uh, a more classic feel of, of, of the black and white photograph versus um, the Canson Infinity uh, Platine, uh, where it's, it's a lot cooler. Um, so I think that that's when you're thinking about paper, not only think about um, the texture, but also think about um, what, what's the tonality that, that's uh, part of the paper. Um, here, um, just giving you an idea of like how uh, the glossy versus matte uh, papers feel. Um, when uh, you know the thing is, a, a lot of people when they think about glossy, they think about this shimmery paper that is 100% reflective. That when they look at, they they see their face more than uh, the actual image. But the truth is that on the fine art papers, and specifically the ones that um, that, that we carry, they uh, are they they they're basically on a, a different kind of like scale of, of glossy. Um, they or we want to call it um, semi gloss. Um, they're still glossy papers, but but the, the interesting thing is that they are only reflective when they're looked at from an angle. So in this particular case, that's what I wanted to kind of like highlight there on this image. So that top image is printed on, on, on the platine paper and the bottom image, and like actually the, the, the image in the middle is the matte paper um, that's printed on the Moab um, Entrada. Um, again, thinking about how images are going to be perceived when printed on the different uh, types of finishes. Um, so some tips, again, when considering paper, um, I think that, like I said, uh, it's very important to consider uh, paper uh, uh, from the onset, and it should be part of your creative process, nothing that you leave kind of like towards the end, um, because that'll affect how you uh, think about your images um, 
because we'll and, and we'll talk about that uh, later when we talk about soft proofing. Um, but uh, you, you know, when when selecting paper and thinking about it, you also need to think about how those um, images are going to be um, and where they're going to be displayed. So. Um, is it going to be uh, a, an area with a lot of bright light, um, a lot of window space, um, or is it going to be in a duller, war warmer light? Um, so th your paper selection is going to interact with the environment um, where it's uh, displayed. So in this particular uh, example that I have here, um, warmer papers will tend to look more opaque. Um, and then, then whiter papers when looked in, in warm light versus um, other situations where uh, you would want to add kind of like a, a, a kind of like a more classic mood or um, add a mood to your to your image through the paper uh, when viewed in, in cooler viewing settings. Um, Another thing there is uh, we talked a little bit about the OBA contents, um, and I, I do want to really stress the fact that OBA content on paper is is detrimental to the archivability of 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 the image and its permanence over time. Uh, so shelf life is important to you. Uh, you would want to always consider uh, non OBA content papers. And you know you you really don't sacrifice saturation or or contrast uh, by choosing a non OBA paper. Um, you're really, uh, as I showed, uh, there's a lot of different options out there that that can clearly uh, give you kind of like that whiteness without actually have to uh, going into um, OBAs. And then glossy over matte. Um, you know I you really want to. Uh, install you to think about the effect, right? What, how do you want people to interact with the image? Um, and not only kind of like the general like rules and guidelines where, you know, people th say that, you know, black and white should be printed on, on glossy paper and that, and that um, color should be printed on, on mats. I think it's, it's all about the overall feel and what you want to express through your imagery. Uh, that's important. Um, so a lot of the times, even with color, like there's a lot of subtlety to it. I think that matte papers really work well in in, in enhancing subtlety and, and softness in images, regardless of them being in black and white or or color. Um, but if you have uh, more defined lines and punchier colors that you really want to bring out, then that's that's where the glossy paper will come in. So I don't know, Paige, if you if if we have any questions uh, yet that um, that we can address before we move into uh, the printmaking part of 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 the workflow question. Um, so we don't have too many questions, but someone is wondering whether you use an Epson or a Canon printer. So I I exclusively use uh, Epson printers. Um, I don't use uh, Canon printers. Um, there is there is no um, true kind of reason for that. Um, it's mainly uh, just I I like consistency, <laughs> so um, that's the reason why I I chose uh, to 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 print uh, with a Canon. Uh, it does bother me that I have to be switching inks, um, and it does uh, come at a cost, but um, I think they're fast and they're really reliable printers. So, um, you you know, there's fantastic versions of 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 of, of both on both brands. If you're thinking about investing uh, on a printer for home, right. And another question. Um, I'm not sure if you really use uh, the silver gelatin paper, but um, do you know the similarities between a semi gloss and a silver gelatin, or do you so yeah, um, no, I, I don't print on silver gelatin. But um, in terms of of th there's a couple of things to consider there. One is we're printing on on uh, with an inkjet, so there's going to be 
dots um, added to the paper versus the silver gelatin is is, is a paper that you're going to be um, uh, exposing light to. Um, so it's continuous tones versus uh, non-continuous tone. Um, but in terms of the feel of the paper, um, there are different uh, papers out, out, out there that, that really uh, have a silver uh, gelatin feel. Um, I think that the Bria rag has a very uh, close feel to it. Um, it's just a little warmer. Um, but they, then again, um, you can get different grades of 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 of, uh, of the white point on on the um, silver gelatin paper. Hopefully, I was able to answer that. Yep. And he, there was another question about similar inkjet papers. So I think you answered that with the juniper. Okay. Great. Yes. And yeah. And in in the platine paper also um, is is a very nice paper when compared to. Um, um, kind of like an old school um, paper, lab paper, basically. Great. I think we can keep going. Awesome. So um, I wanted to highlight a couple of things here um, for for printmaking. And um, so the, the main thing is that there is no um, magic bullet. Uh, there is no one true way to go about the process. I think that the process is more um, trying to build control about um, what you're doing in order to um, have very consistent results throughout um, your printing um, workflow. Um, one of those uh, important elements is highlighted there is number one, monitoring calibration. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit in extent, um, but we'll focus more on calibration because I feel that um, it's kind of like that's one of the biggest pitfalls um, uh, uh, that we need to shore up. Um, color space, we're going to spend some time talking about file types and image resolution, and lastly, the histogram. So um, monitor and uh, calibration. So I, I think that kind of like the biggest and most important thing is that um, as you're editing your images, um, you use a calibrated monitor. Um, there's a lot of different uh, uh, spectrometers uh, and colorimeters out there that will achieve that. Um, it's important that you actually use a device and not use kind of like your eyes to to calibrate your monitor. Um, I know that, for example, if you're if you're working off of a Mac, um, they have a um, um, a way to actually they tell you oh, squint. Uh, set yourself up, you know, a couple feet away from the image, and and squint. And make sure that this line, the 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 lines start to uh, blend, um, and so on and so forth. But that's not accurate. Um, uh, your your eyes are going to be um, misguiding you in that process, and the reason for that is that um, well, there's ambient light to also consider. Um, and the cool thing about the, the the spectrometers and the colorimeters is that they they take that bias out. Um, so it's going to be uh, extremely important that that you that you're um, constantly um, calibrating your 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 monitor. If it's a new monitor, uh, you don't have to do it as as, as often as uh, on older models. You probably would want to be um, calibrating them like. Uh, every month, every couple of months. Uh, but that's, in terms of color accuracy, that's gonna be one of the things that you that you definitely wanna be investing on. Um, I like the iDisplay Pro from x -Ray. I think uh, uh, the, the, the main reason why I use it is because it allows you more versatility in the UI than others, um, but they all kind of do the same thing. So in terms of getting to a, a, a calibrated screen, um, they all do a really good job. Um, in terms of your monitor, uh, I think it's kind of like the most important thing is that it displays 99% of the Adobe RGB color space. Uh, some tout 100%, um, but 99% is, is more than good enough. Um, the other important thing is that they're non-reflective. 
Um, and the reason for that is because uh, when you're editing, um, even your your shadow casted over the the monitor will affect color and how you perceive it. So um, a matted screen is going to be way better than than um, than a glossy screen. So if you're uh, let's say editing on a MacBook Pro, um, you you would want to um, compensate, and I guess you'll get that through experience from printing a number of times. Uh, compensate for the reflectiveness and the added kind of like contrast that um, shiny and and reflective screens have. So uh, before we move to the next slide, I don't know if we have any questions regarding calibration and monitors? No, I think we can keep going. Great. So color space is, is, is the other area that's, um, that we, we need to consider. Uh, we talked a little bit about it when, when, when thinking about buying a monitor, right? So it needs to have the Adobe RGB color space. The widest color space I think uh, uh, that we need to highlight here is is the pro photo rgb color space that is the widest color space available unfortunately there is no display out there that would be able to um, showcase this color space so um, although you would want to edit on it when you're exporting your files and sharing it with your printer or uh, out uh, outputting them for print for yourself um, that you export them using the Adobe RGB color space. That's the color space that you're going to be basically looking at through your screen. So um, that's going to be important. That The other thing is, um, and I, I noted there, is uh, when we think about raw images, we a lot of the times think about them just in terms of the amount of pixels and, and uh, the amount of data that's within them and how that gives us more latitude when making changes and edits on whatever software we use. But um, another added benefit that I, I don't think people talk about a lot is the fact that uh, we are able to assign color spaces to the to raw images uh, versus, um, uh, let's say, when, when, when you're shooting um, JPEG files directly off of your camera. Um, there are they, they they are pegged basically from the onset with the sRGB color space. So when thinking about raw, also think about the fact that you're getting um, a wider color space versus um, just uh, when when you're shooting in raw on on JPEG from your from your camera that you you have a limited color space. Uh, the same thing goes if you're shooting, um, you know, using your camera phone, right? Um, there's uh, applications that will allow you to to shoot in RAW with your camera phone, and I think that that's an advantage because once you shoot with your camera phone on um, uh, and exporting directly to JPEG, uh, that the sRGB color space is going to be be assigned to them, and you're going to lose um, a lot of the color uh range in in that image um so so it's it's going to be really important for you to 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 export uh your files again like in in the adobe rgb color space but if you're soft proofing your your images and i don't know if you're very familiar with soft proofing we can i can answer questions around that but um when you're exporting files that you've soft proofed um it's very important that you assign that ICC profile to 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 the image uh, before you send it to the printer. That way, when the printer gets the file, they they know um, what profile to use before printing. Um, and this is where um, I'm going to be transit between this slide and the next um, and then in the next topic uh, because ICC profiles are extremely important in in gaining control over your images and how they're going to be seen at the end. Um, because uh, as you could see here, um, there's a difference between uh, each color space. In this case, I'm comparing only the Adobe RGB against the um, sRGB color space. Um, but every single color space has its own shape. Um, 
And when we're doing soft proofing in that process, what we're trying to do is bring um, the colors within the image into the new color space without losing the tonal uh, composition of, of our image. So uh, it's kind of like very important that we, that we go through that process and understand the soft proofing process because it'll only enhance our ability to control the output of our of, of our print. So here I'm I'm comparing. Um, I took a sample of the uh, the color space uh, the ICC profile that we that we built uh, for the Moab Entrada uh, rag um, and compared it to the Adobe RGB color space. And the same thing with the Juniper Brida. Uh, the color the ICC profiles that we use here at Photo Innovation Lab are custom. Um, you can definitely download um, the ICC profiles from the paper uh, houses that you're you're buying paper from. Um, generally, those are going to be good to go. Um, but like I said, I like a lot of control um, and uh, having custom made uh, profiles makes uh, a lot of sense for me um, and for 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 the, that ability to control the output. So. Um, if you're printing with us, you can uh, request ICC profiles. So we will share those with you. You can install those on your computer and do your own soft, soft proofing uh, and letting us know what profile you're using uh, and on what printer, what paper you're going to be printing on. And, and we'll do that for you. Um, so looking at these two, the important thing to note is that um, even on the paper, some have a wider gamut depending on 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 certain uh, cuts of 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 the color uh, tonality range here on on the on the graph, so uh, it's really interesting because even when you're when you're editing, in some cases you're going to be we're, you're not going to be able to 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 edit to the amount of available. Uh, tonality on the paper, and that's just the limit of the technology. Um, but again, if you're using the Adobe RGB color space, um, or even if you're editing on Profoto RGB, you're going to be uh, good to go. Again, as long as you have a calibrated monitor and um, and you're displaying that 99 or 100 percent of the Adobe RGB color space. And just going back quickly, um, yes, do you have a recommendation for a desktop monitor? So uh, there's a there's a number there there's a lot of very good brands. Um, ASIO is a good brand uh, for a desktop monitor. Um, there's the C CS twenty four o four that's at a good price point. Um, or BenQ also produces uh, very nice monitors. Um, I think that um, there there are a, a lot of different flavors um, in, in in options. I think that kind of like the most important thing is that, um, and I probably kind of like brushed over this or didn't or forgot to mention, but um, the, the fact that uh, the monitor is hardware calibrated. Um, if you want to take note of that, um, hardware calibration in monitors is really important because it allows a wider, uh, uh, let's say more accuracy when, when, when calibrating it. Um, and they'll hold true to that calibration uh, better than uh, non-hardware calibrated uh, monitors. And kind of like the difference between them too is think about like having a, a, an extra video card added now to the monitor, um, so so it basically works uh, similar to like your the, the video card that you have on your PC, right? But um, with the added benefit of of uh, more lookup tables, um, and I don't want to get like into the technicality of it, but um, definitely look into a hardware calib uh, uh, calibrated monitor and um, that has the Adobe RGB uh, color space at 199%. And then 
is it better to soft proof in Lightroom or Photoshop? So I, I am extremely biased uh, towards Lightroom. I think that Lightroom has uh, uh, kind of like a simpler way to, to do the soft proofing. Um, in Photoshop, it's hard to, to look at um, the before and after and compare two images at the same time. Um, and, and why I'm saying that is because in Lightroom, when you're soft proofing, you're able to compare your soft proof to your master print at the same time. So in, in my workflow, what I do is I always create a, a, a new version of my file. So, um, so I have the original, I create a, a, a clone of it. And then I apply the new pro the ICC profile for soft proofing to the clone, and then I compare them too um, at the same time, and that basically allows me to um, understand how color and tonality works on the original image, and how the ICC profile um, is affecting tonality in the new image. Well, in the same image as I'm getting it ready for export, um, so. Uh, that's why I like uh, working off of the, the Lightroom um, environment versus Photoshop, where you have to select um, basically one setting. If you're soft proofing, you're 100% soft proofing. Um, you can't look at the image without it being in kind of that soft proof mode. And then, what software are you using to compare um, the ICC profiles? Oh, this is ColorSync. So if if you have um, a Mac, um, it it is built in. So uh, you can compare once you 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 add your your profiles, the the profiles that you either custom made or the profiles that you downloaded from 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 the paper uh, manufacturers. You you're going to be able to see them. I can actually switch over quickly to show you um, the how that looks like on here. So this is this is basically color sync. Um, you're you're able to see this, right? Yes. Yep. Uh, awesome. So here are my custom profiles. Um, and this is basically how the Infinity Rag Platine looks like. Um, and then the different um, papers that I use uh, and the different printers that I use. So you would want definitely to have a different ICC profile for uh, dedicated for the printer and the paper. So basically, um, they're not interchangeable. Um, and that's why also why there's profiles for each uh, paper printer combination when you're downloading them from 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 the paper manufacturers. So here's a, again, we talked about the Adobe RGB. I can share with you quickly um, the Profoto RGB. Um, it is so large, it doesn't even fit in this little box. Um, and then how it compares, you could easily, here you click on lap plot and you hold for comparison and then you can go to your, let's say, to Adobe RGB and compare that. So that's Profoto RGB against um, Adobe RGB. Another cool thing is that when you're editing in Lightroom, um, you're seeing uh, Lightroom displays images unless they are, um, unless they are uh, pre-selected in terms of like you've giving them a color space, um, they're going to be showcased in in pro in the Profoto RGB um, color space. So if you're editing and your workflow is based off in Lightroom, uh, you are looking. There's no color assignment. The color assignment is really Profoto RGB. And then when you let's say if your workflow says, okay, I want to make some very um, uh, dedicated changes to the to, to to my image that require Photoshop when you export the when you go into Photoshop um, Photoshop will ask you what color space uh, you you want to be working on 
um, either you can keep it in Profoto RGB or you can like immediately uh, change it to Adobe RGB and make your changes in Adobe RGB, knowing that once you bring it back into Lightroom, that file is now in the Adobe RGB color space. Um, we do have more questions, but I think you might be answering them throughout the rest of the presentation. So we'll keep going. And then at the end, we can go back to some of these questions. Awesome. So um, file types, um, when exporting our images is, is crucial uh, because those are the files that are going to be sharing with your printer. And you want to make sure that your files are of the best uh, quality for them to be able to output your images at the highest quality again. Uh, so when you're exporting your files, I highly recommend that you export them as 16-bit TIFF files. Um, what the 16-bit uh, will do is it'll it, it'll it'll allow more tonality and color to be saved within the file uh, versus and this is versus 8-bit. Um, so J JPEG files are only 8-bit, and so whenever you're exporting to uh, the JPEGs and sharing JPEGs for printing outputs, um, you're losing a lot of color information on the file. And how that works is basically um, you got to think of it as a, um, it's it's really exponential. So if you think about the bit in terms of two. Um, it's two to the eighth power, um, if you're thinking about a JPEG 8-bit file, or two to the 16th power, if you're thinking about a 16-bit file. Um, so uh, if you wanna preserve uh, the tonal range, if you're thinking about, uh, if you think about um, uh, smooth gradation, 16-bit file is extremely mandatory for you when you're, when you're, when, when, when you're exporting because um, otherwise, you'll lose a lot of that transition data, and that may uh, affect banding uh, when you print. And TIFF files, uh, TIFF files um, are files um, are kind of like the best output uh, format. Um, it doesn't compress data, so basically, uh, they become really large files, and um, the more data they have, the better. Uh, that's how I see it, even if it means more hard drive space. Um, but here, the more the merrier. Uh, so try to export always to TIFF. Um, and if if you're working off of Photoshop and you have a lot, a lot of layer content, I highly recommend that you flatten those TIFF files before you export them um, or during export um, because you don't want to be sending your 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 printer uh, all your layers, and that's just because there could be an error, and somebody may change some layer and really uh, dramatically affect your work by mistake. So you want to really prevent uh, these type of things happening. Um, so flatten your tiffs, um, save them as uh, sixteen bits um, is 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 crucial when. Uh, producing files for high quality output. Um, if you're printing with the third party, you should send uh, the image files is in, in with the Adobe RGB uh, color color space assigned to them. And the reason for that, again, you we we talked a, a lot about that uh, a little bit ago. Um, it's uh, it's very important that you do because that way you you guarantee that um, the color space that you're using is exactly the same color space that they're going to be using. Um, if you are soft proofing yourselves and sending to your printer, I highly recommend that you ask your printer for their ICC profiles. If they have custom profiles, ask for those. Uh, that'll guarantee that what you look at is exactly what they're going to be looking at in their screens. Um, of course, there's going to be some variability depending on like the viewing setting, because as we talked a little bit when we uh, covered kind of monitors, ambient light is going to affect how how you perceive images even from your screen. So um, 
but the most important thing again is control, right? And how do you control the process is by um, delivering exactly the same, talking the same language that your printer does. So in this particular case, it would be the ICC profile. If you, if your printer does not use custom ICC profiles, they use the paper manufacturer's ICC profiles, then go ahead and use those. Um, but otherwise, um, use the ones provided by your printer. Another big important thing is always, um, and this is, um, I, I think it should be part of everybody's workflow is uh, always note the, 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 the profile that you're using to export your file. So the more information the, the printer gets um, without having to dig into your file, uh, the better, because it just makes the process a lot smoother. There's a lot less questions. Um, so if you're saving your, if your output file, you profiled it, um, you did your soft proof uh, for the Moab and Trata rag on, let's say, and you're printing on a P6000, the Epson P6000, uh, note that on your export file so that the when, when the printer gets it, they know to put that file and print it using that ICC profile. Um, otherwise, uh, they wouldn't know and, and you know, there could be changes to, to your file once it's printed. Um, image resolution. I don't know if we want to talk about more ICC stuff before we go into um, this as it changes a little bit of the subject. Um, we did have a question about, do, uh, do you view under D5000 light? So I use, so the, the, that's a, that's a good question, right? So I, in terms of the ambient light, I try to control it as much as possible in, in, in my work studio. Um, I use, I, I do have uh, the little box of the lighting that, that I, that I use. It's this guy. Um, it outputs light at, um, 5,000, uh, Ah, I for, uh, Kelvin. Sorry about that. Um, uh, so it's 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 basically calibrated to daylight, um, and that's pretty. It's kind of like the best uh, um, color temperature to use in in your space. Um, always, of course, uh, try to maintain your space uh, to be in a constant color uh, environment. Uh, so. For example, if you're, I think that somebody talked uh, about this on an earlier uh, webcast, and it's really, really important. I can stress that is that when you're editing, try to edit always in the same room um, at the same time. Um, if you can't control, uh, let's say the lighting conditions, because it's a it's a room that has a lot of windows. You, I, I think it's part of the discipline. You have to edit there, um, like around the same times. Um, you don't want to be editing um, in in the morning, and then uh, when you look at it in, let's say, in the evening when the sun's coming down, um, that's going to change the viewing conditions, uh, and that's going to definitely affect the way that you see the file from your monitor. So, um, controlling uh, your your the color within your workspace is going to be um, extremely important. So. Yes, uh, I do have, um, we do try to control that as, as much as we can within the space. I don't have a lot of windows where, where, where we print. Um, so um, the lighting condition is, is extremely constant in, in that area. Great. And then um, what brand and model number, you, I'm not sure if you'll have this on you, but for viewing light bulbs? So there, uh, I mean, there's, there's so many out there. I mean, LED lights are, I, I feel the way to go because of course they're, they're, they're very consistent in their output. But I mean, the ones that I use when you, when you look at them uh, online, they're, these are feet electric. Um, I can uh, share um, some information later, but um as long as they have day, they're calibrated to daylight in 5,000 Kelvin, um, that's uh, going to be good. What I like about these guys, well, one, they're big. They're really made for out, outdoor spaces. So they're barn lights. 
but and there, there's of course there's more regular light bulb type ones. Uh, but what I like about these guys is that they're big um, and and they they really spread out light uh, very evenly. Um, so uh, I recommend these, but there's of course the round light bulbs as well. Um, but no, I don't have a brand that I really, I, I'm not really married to a brand, but I'm married to the calibration of how much light it's going to output and the, the color of that light. That's, that's the most important thing, 5,000 Kelvin. Great. Um, any other question? Um, I think we'll keep going through and then try to get to some of these other questions at the end. Great. So image resolution, I, I th this one, I, I added in there because I, I feel that this is kind of like extremely important because, um, there's a lot of misconception with regards to, um, uh, image resolution. And there's this number that gets tossed around the 300 PPI or 300 DPI. Um, and it confuses, um, a lot of us. Um, it took a while for me to uh, wrap my head around this one in terms of how do I explain it to 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 others. Um, but I think kind of like the main, the most important thing when thinking about um, kind of like the image resolution here is think about image dimensions with respect to the print size. Um, so what that means is how big your image is in its dimensions, like that and width, compared to uh, where you're gonna be printing it on. So 11 by 14, nine by 12, eight by 10, right? Um, and that's where that 300 PPI number really comes in to um, be part of it. So the majority of printers today, they have a maximum a resolution of 300 PPI, which means that they'll, they, they're printing um, 300 pixels per inch. Um, and that's the resolution they take. So um, what that means in terms of size, what I did is in this chart, um, I, I, I basically did the calculation for you. So if you're gonna pr print a four by six, at 300 ppi you want to have a file that's at least 1200 by 1800 pixels um and i go all the way down to 24 by by 36 where you would need a file that has 7200 by 10800 uh pixels but that's kind of like a little outrageous right so um it's important in this uh process of thinking about image resolution to also think about um how that image is going to be viewed and how that image is going to be viewed will also affect your 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 let's say tolerance for um resolution if you will so a, a four by six for example so it's a print that you're going to be holding in your hands you're probably going to be looking at it inches away from your face same thing with an eight by ten right um so what happens is if you have a lower resolution file um, is that you're going to be looking at uh, at the pixels when you're holding that print or looking at that print um, really close to your face. Um, you're going to be seeing some of that uh, pixel distortion, which doesn't happen when you go into the larger sizes, right? So if you're thinking about uh, a print that's 20 by 30, you're probably going to be looking at that print from a couple feet away. Um, so you're not going to be um, that close to it, and therefore you can live without uh, having those 300 pixels per inch. Um, I've printed really, really nice files, uh, images um, with 100 ppi, um, 16 by 20 and larger. Um, and the reason for that is, again, like the viewing range is is, is farther. So... Um, if you, it, it, to put a comparison here is like, if you see, if you see a billboard when, when, when those, you know, the billboards for, for, 
uh, for, you know, shot with, with an iPhone, right? And you think, well, I took this picture with an iPhone. And, I mean, I don't know how they got it to be blown up to, to the size of, 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 um, of a billboard if I can't really even print it at 12 by 18, right? Um, but they do use um, software to upscale, um, upscale them. Um, but the other thing is that they're printed at like 10 DPI, 10 PPI, right? So because of the distance, that you have between the print and the subject or the viewer, um, it affects um, that the, the resolution, your ability to actually see the pixel distortion. So um, what I'm saying here, it's kind of like, if you want to take note is, you know, from 16 by 20 down, you definitely want to try to hit those 300 PPIs on your dimensions. Um, and then from there up, there's a little bit more wiggle room uh, with regards to how many pixels per inch you want to be hitting. Uh, the other important thing here uh, that I wanted to know is like, note is is cropping, right? Because when we, we when we are shooting, um, sometimes uh, we 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 take a picture and then we think about it later and we start cropping, right? When we start cropping that image, we're losing um, on those dimensions, and those are really the critical part of the whole image resolution component. Um, once you start losing those pixels, there is no way to get them back. So you could have started with a 4,000 by 6,000 image, um, and then you cropped it uh, you know, to focus on a particular area, and now you're left with, with half of the pixels. Well, that means that you just half the amount of you know, half your print size. Um, and you would have to go through an upscaling um, process to get it back to 300 PPI. And that, of course, would never get uh, you to the quality that, that you had originally. So um, the key here is if you're thinking about, if you, if you print your work and, or you're thinking about printing your work, it's, it's, it's a really good habit to to get into and is composing those images as best you can in the camera. So when you go out and take that photo, make sure that you're not taking just the picture that you're gonna know that you're gonna have to crop later on, crop it at the shoot as much as you can. Um, so that when you get that file into your, um, into your uh, editing software, you have as much data as possible and you can blow up that picture as, as much as you can. So um, I'm going to move to the next one. This is kind of like and our just last. Just quickly, yeah, if you can go back. Um, what's that last number um, for a 24 by 36 print size under um, 150 PPI, just because we can't see it? Oh, sorry. Um, it's uh, 3,600 by uh, 5,400. So it's okay. half of that 7,200 by 10. Uh, 10,800. And some people are asking for this chart afterwards. We are going to post this presentation after, so you will be able to go back to it. Awesome. Yeah, and it's, I mean, you could do the math yourself. Of course, you're going to get it, but um, it's just 24 by 300. Uh, let's say in the case of the 24 by 36, 24 by 300. Uh, and then 36 by 300, and then if you want to compare that to 100 PPI, that would be um, 24 by 150 and 36 by 150. So um, we do have one more question about: um, Is there what's the best process to res up or increase the file size for a larger print? Yeah, I, I think that 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 would be another a good um, 30 minutes of 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 a of a workshop. But I mean, the simple question is there, there is a process in Photoshop where you can upsample your images. The problem is that you cannot upsample an image um, in large steps because the software, what it's doing, it's recreating the pixels that are missing. So it's making assumptions based on, 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 on your image and lines and patterns to come up with the new pixels, because let's say in this particular case, you you have 
1200 by 800 image that you want to print at, at 8 by 10. And that's half the size, right? Because you technically need 12, uh, 2400 by 3000. So the idea is to do it uh, by steps. Um, and so in Photoshop, what you would do is go to the um, image resolution. Uh, let me see. Well, I, I don't want to open Photoshop right now, but um, go to image resolution. And then under there, you'll see the dimensions that you have, the target dimensions that you want. So you add the target dimensions that you want. That'll make the resolution lower. So for example, uh, you know, again, looking at that four by six, right? If you have a 1200 by 1800 image and you want to make it an eight by 10 at 300 PPI, once you put your target dimensions, so the 2400 by the, the 2400 by 3000, it'll drop your resolution to let's say 100. So what you'll do now is you're going to start upsampling that image. So instead of going, going on where it says, um, your PPIs at the bottom, um, you're instead of seven, the 100 that's going to appear there, you're going to say instead of 300, because that's a huge jump, uh, you're going to say, uh, you're going to upsample by, by a factor of 20. So a 20% increase. So let's say in this case, you go from 100 to 120. You let the process uh, run, go into your file, look, make sharpening adjustments uh, to the file, um, make any corrections that you feel that are necessary there, then go back into the image resolution, increase that from 120 to 140 and so on. And it's, it's a long process, but it'll get you to the best possible um, 300 PPI uh, image um, it, doing the upsampling. Other than that, you're wasting your time from going uh, from 100 to 300 because it'll it'll just destroy your image. Um, it just you know by that at that time so you can just stretch it and do the same thing. Um, just because of the fact that uh, what what Photoshop is doing is making a lot of assumptions. Um, in order to, to give you that new amount of pixels. And it's really hard to explain this without actually doing it, but um, that hopefully that, that helped answer the question. Okay, Paige? Yeah, we, we can keep, awesome. keep going. Yep. Awesome. And then I think that the last one uh, here is is the histogram. And with regards to the histogram, we, we, we all know it's like take a balanced image. Uh, histogram needs to uh, look, uh, it has to have a bell shape or whatever. Um, when, but when we're printing, the histogram really becomes important because um, it really gives you uh, a better sense of of tonal ranges in the image. Um, so this is where I, I'm gonna just jump uh, quickly into Lightroom so that I could uh, share that better with you. Um, give me a second. And Lightroom. Right, so you're looking at my Lightroom. And so uh, in this particular image, right, this is the histogram area here. Um, it goes from blacks all the way to the whites. Um, and the, the important thing when looking at the histogram before you print, right, because you, before you, you went through all your edits, you changed tones, you increased highlights, you did whatever you wanted until you got to that perfect image, right? Um, but now it's a time to print, and now you got to think that you're not going to be viewing your image um, from a screen anymore. You're going to be looking at it from paper, and that's going to be reflected light versus um, uh, ref uh, like pushed out light, if you will, uh, for lack of a better word right now. Um, so, so what happens if, if in this case, I'm just going to change the slider here. Um, and I'm going to compress my histogram. Um, 
just to give you an example, right? So this is, let's say where I netted out, this is my, my ultimate edit. I really like how this image looks and now I want to print it. Um, so what I, my approach to this is, is do I have a true white or true black in my image? And the reason for that is because when you print and you do not have a true white or a true black, then you're going to be printing a tone or a shade of gray, let's say, or a shade of another color into the paper, and you're going to lose the brightness and you're going to compress that um, the tonal range within your image, and it'll make it look duller um, when you print it on the paper. So, and Juan, is yes. there a way that we can see the histogram? Uh, yes. I don't know what you're seeing, so let me. Is that better? No. You're still not capturing it here? I don't no. know. Okay, so no, then I don't know if there's a better way to do that. Okay. And I'm going to be sorry, then I'm going to go back to the slide. Um, let me see why what you're seeing. I can't see what you're seeing. Okay, you're just seeing kind of like that little square. Let me see if I can. We're going to let webinar jam do a better job at this because <laughs> I don't know why it's not showing the entire thing. Um, I'm sorry about that, guys. So I'll 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 owe you that histogram bit example on 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 Lightroom, but I can definitely uh, speak to it. Let me go back to the slide so you're not looking just at that image. Um, actually, I sorry. Let me go back into it and without looking at the histogram um, for you guys. At least I am looking at it. Um, so, so this is my final edit right and uh i'm ready for print what i'm going to do is look at the histogram think about it. My, my histogram now looks like there is no true white so the, it bottoms out right before it gets to to the whites and it doesn't really get into the blacks it barely touches kind of like that left uh axis of the of of the chart so because i want to want to ensure that um I have true whites and true true blacks. I'm gonna select the um, the like the the highlight clipping and the shadow clipping on the histogram here in Lightroom, and then I'm gonna start pulling in those whites. So I'm gonna use the white slider to get some whites in my image until I start seeing them, and you'll start seeing you start seeing the red right there. That's the red. That's where I'm clipping the whites. Um, this is a very um, um, delicate process. Um, I think it's a lot of people get it. They think that oh, just you know, when I'll just clip some of the whites. But it's really important that that you zoom in and you and you make sure that you're not losing important data, uh, important detail from your image. In this case. It's already uh, blown out the water reflection, uh, so I don't mind if I overdo that area on my clipping, because there is no detail that I want to preserve when I print. But when I print this image, um, I am going to guarantee that there is no tone added to that area, and what that will give my eye is the ability to. Um, to make a wider interpretation of of what I'm seeing on the print, because if that was a gray, let's say, let's go back to um, before I started pulling in those whites, um, you see that there's now this gray cast over the image. Um, if if I print this way, then there's going to be gray in that area of the water and not white, so the paper will not shine through basically and and that's the effect that that it gives you when when i open it up it it, it kind of like removes that cast the thing is um when i print this image it's going to look more like my original one but with a wider tonal range versus this like super blown out what ultra white image so um 
Uh, that's from the white perspective. The same thing goes um, for the blacks. Um, you want to make sure that they are in there. You're going to start to see the blue coming in. Well, that is area that I don't really care about. The detail there, I don't really care about. So I can continue to go all the way until I start to lose detail that I really care about. And that's, let's say, right about there. That's where I would stop. And then I would go into the soft proofing module. Then I started making my soft proof adjustments because now I know that my image has a true white and has a true black. But let's say that the that um, that you like uh, that your editing style has um, pushed your let's say blacks all the way um, to to the right. So you like have that faded black, right? That matted black in your edit. Well, you don't have to bring it all the way to the left um, to say like have a true black because it's going to be impossible without losing the detail in your image. What you want to do then is just make sure you bring it down as much as you can without losing the detail. Again, it's a very meticulous process where you're going to be looking at your image and looking for your kind of like tolerance level to the loss of detail as you bring in those blacks and as you bring in those whites. Again, the idea here is to uh, expand the tonal range of your image when you're printing it uh, versus when you're seeing it on the screen. Again, like looking at the histogram as a, as a kind of like a database versus what you're looking at because when you're looking at it on the screen uh, you may have the brightness up all the way um, or not and that's skewing your ability to perceive um, the white point of your image if you will um, i know that this one is definitely one that i would love to have a workshop on so let me go back to my presentation and that kind of like is going to be the end of it. So um, I don't know if we have any more questions. Here's my uh, information. I know that that page has uh, kind of like the offer that we have for today, which is the 15%. The 15% is going to be good through the rest of the month. Uh, so take advantage of it. And um, my email is, uh, Juan Carlos at Photo Innovation Lab, you can drop me an email, ask any questions as well uh, with regards to this topic or any other printing topic, and I'll be happy to answer. Yeah, and if you have any questions for Moab, you can always email us as well, um, and we can answer any questions that we didn't get to. I do have another question that just came in. Um, yeah. In Lightroom, do you set up TIFF and preferences? Um, how do you send a TIFF to the printer in Lightroom? Okay, so um, let me see if I can share that because Lightroom, I don't know why it's not show, showing the entire Lightroom. Um, but when you click export, the export module gives you the ability to um, tell Lightroom how you want to export the file. Let me see if I can I can show you that quickly here. Okay, here I am. Let me. See, do you see anything that I'm doing? Let me see if I uh, export module. So I'm clicking export on this image. Um, in this case, it's going to say that uh, I don't have this image here. It's fine because, right? So this is. Do you see the export module? No. Uh, I think it's just because you can only see. Um... Oh, let me see if I can. Let me see if I can see screen application window. Oh, look at that! Boom! There we go. So we see this one, right? Yes. Okay, beautiful. So, so this is um, here uh, under file settings. This is where you have JPEG. You want to save it as a PSD. You want to save it as a TIFF, PNG, DNG, or the original. Um, this is where you're going to define that. So TIFF is the way to go. No compression. Bit def. This is where you select your 16-bit component. 
Um, important here, if you took your image, if you the image is already a JPEG, there's nothing you can do. You you you're not gonna like do anything to it by saving it 16-bit component because it, it won't create more data for you. Um, so if it's if you if your if your original file is a JPEG, it's already 8-bit and there's nothing to do. Um, if your image is raw, then definitely 16-bit is going to be something that you want to make sure that you select uh, there. And then the cool thing is here is is the color space, and this is what I was talking about. So this is where you decide uh, how you want to export the file. So let's say that I want to print on on the Moab Intrada Rag Natural. I profile the, uh, the image. Um, I did my soft proofing, I did my color correction, and I'm ready to print, and I'm ready to send it to my printer. We've shared the ICC profiles. So I make sure that that color space is selected in there, and then I click on export. Then the other thing is on image sizing, don't touch that. I do not recommend resizing your images to fit anything unless you're doing it for the web. And that's a totally different story, but don't do anything here. Don't do any output sharpening at this uh, stage. The output sharpening should be done when um, you're actually in the print screen, um, in the printing module. So uh, here you're going to be in file name. You're going to be um, renaming this to whatever your name is, but include, like I said, include the 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 color space that you're exporting it to, um, and if you want, it would really help. I would I know that I would really appreciate that. You know, if it if you saved it with 16 bit or 8 bit, um, more so that if you saved it with 16. And the reason for that is because um, that'll change the way that I set up my print, uh, in, in the the printing module. Um, I'll just make sure that I select 16 bits. Otherwise, I have to go into Photoshop and look at the file and then bring it in, and then un to understand like what the bit def uh, definition is for that particular file. Hopefully that answered the question, but this is kind of like where it all happens in this export um, section. Great. Okay, I think that's all we have time for today, but um, feel free to email either Juan or Moab with any other questions. And we're also going to have some more classes on Moab TV. So we have the live Q&As and some more classes coming up. So just stay updated on our website. Um, and then also in the offer section, there's the 15% off for prints at Photo Innovation Lab. If you'd like to use that, um, take a look at the offer section. And this will also be posted in a few days on our YouTube channel, so you can go back to all of these videos. And thanks, Juan. No, thank you, guys. Uh, I really appreciate the, the opportunity to, to do this and uh, to be in front of uh, all of you guys. And hopefully this was helpful. And uh, again, let me know if you have any questions. Um, my, I think, Paige, you have my contact information. but. Um, Yes, Juan Carlos at Photo Innovation Lab, and uh, hope to hear from you.